Good afternoon, everyone. It is Wednesday, August 26th, 2020. And with that, I call the monthly community oversight board meeting to order. First, we'll begin by the reading uh, with the reading of the appeal statement pursuant to the provisions of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws. Please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville in Davidson County Community Oversight Board may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review under a common law writ of cert. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days of, after entry of a final decision by the board. Any person or other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure the time and procedural requirements are met. With that, we'll establish quorum during a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Here. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Goddard. Dr. Hildred. Present. Thank you. Mr. Holloway. Here. Mr. Holloway, good afternoon. Mr. Hughes. I am here. Good afternoon, Mr. Hughes. Dr. Lewis. Mr. Martinez. Present. Good afternoon, Mr. Martinez. Ms. Ross. Present. Good afternoon, Ms. Ross. Mr. Sweeney. Present, yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Witzel. I'm here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Witzel. Do we have Mr. Goddard on the line? Yeah. You do. I'm here. Hi, Mr. Goddard. Good afternoon. And uh, Dr. Lewis. Lewis is not quite with us yet, so we'll keep our eyes and ears here. We have uh, 10 of 11 uh, members of the board, so we have quorum uh, necessary to proceed. With that, uh, Mr. Pinkley, if you could uh, lead us in the electronic meeting statement. Uh, thank you, Chair Davis. Uh, so as we've done with all of our our meetings that we've done electronically so far, uh, I'll just give the, the brief background and then we'll just need a motion, uh, a second and a vote. Uh, on March 20, on March 20th, 2020, uh, Governor Lee issued Executive Order 16 suspending in-person quorum requirements for, elect, uh, for public meetings. Uh, that order has been extended uh, multiple times throughout the coronavirus pandemic, most recently with Executive Order 51. Uh, Exec Executive Order 51 is currently scheduled to expire on August 29th, 2020. Uh, I have not seen an extension of that order yet, but I will keep my eyes open and notify the board as soon as a decision is made. And uh, so in order for today's business, we just need a motion and a second that uh, the board is meeting today to conduct essential business and is meeting electronically to protect the safety and welfare of Tennesseans. Thank you, Mr. Pink. Anyone, is there a motion? So move. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Any focused discussion? If not, all those in favor, uh, please indicate Mr. Campbell Gooch. Aye. Mr. Goddard? Aye. Dr. Hilden? Aye. Mr. Holloway? Aye. Mr. Hughes? Aye. Thank you. Dr. Lewis is not with us yet. Um, Mr. Martinez? Aye. Ms. Uh, Ross? Aye. Mr. Sweeney? Aye. Mr. Witzel. Aye. Thank you very much. Well, I've worked both eyes well. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Pinkley. We'll next move to the approval of the minutes. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you very much. In one second. Second. Thank you, Dr. Hildred. Any focused discussion on the approval of the minutes? not we'll take a vote we'll here mr campbell gooch aye thank you mr goddard 
Aye, sorry. No problem. Mr. Holloway. Aye. Mr. Hughes. Aye. Dr. Lewis, not with us yet. Mr. Martinez. Aye. Mr. Martinez. I think you're still on mute. There we go. Was that I, Mr. Uh, Martinez? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Ross? Aye. Ms. Ross? Aye. Thank you. Mr. Sweeney? Aye. Thank you. And Mr. Witzel? Aye. Thank you. Well, I well the, the minutes are approved. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll um, now move to um, our chair remarks here. I just a moment here. I want to pull up here. Share a bit of an. I want to share an update with you all. Um, and then when we get to a later part in the space here. Um, in fact, my remarks are very much chiefly uh, the number nine segment of our agenda um, here, but I, I'd like to begin there with a bit of an overview and then um, answer any questions anyone on the board may have about any of the updates that have taken place. So I'm sure all of us are aware the mayor released a statement and announced uh, the members of the police commission um, tasked with reviewing not just the policies, but also looking to the future. As he stated, Mayor Cooper said this report and the recommendations will be vitally important um, to the information used by the search committee as they interview candidates to um, be our, our city's next chief of police. Um, after, the, after the announcement was made, uh, I, and, and I'm just as you're chair sharing my, my response here, I was shocked by the number of people announced on this commission. Uh, during the, the conversation, you know, the time of when the mayor's office was putting all of this together, you know, I was not in constant communication with them about this, but I thought it was very clear, we made it very clear that the very best way to ensure that we were getting um, information uh, that was able to be processed, that we could get a consensus and have a real um, usable solution in the end was to have a, a group that would be quite frankly, no larger than 10 people. We suggested between eight to 10 people. And so when a 40 plus person commission was announced, uh, I was troubled most immediately by the constitution, the composition of this. And also, if I'm sure many of the members, you all remember, we were intentional about our language that we sent as a board. We, we came together to make sure that uh, marginalized communities had a voice, that they would be have a representative on this particular commission. Um, I noticed right away that there was no uh, member of the transgender community uh, located and identified. And that's troubling, um, not simply because um, of the fact that we had listed in our letter, but because of the disproportionate and, and quite troubling interaction, percentage of intera negative interactions trans people have with police. Um, I noticed, as many of you probably noticed, uh, that there, while there was a representative of a, a, a major uh, Nashville college, there was no representative from any of our HBCUs within Nashville. And so a lot of the, the thought process behind this was completely new and confusing to me. So I did reach out. Uh, I had a conversation and a call with Eric Brown. I followed up that call with Eric with very specific outlined uh, suggestions on ways to, yes, if you have to keep 40 people on this commission, fine, but figure out a way to get people um, able, a smaller group together to get the real work done. Um, and the email I sent, I also outlined that there was a need for it immediately to add a member of the trans, of the Nashville trans community. I even went so far as to give them specific names, just in case they themselves were not aware of uh of people that uh could absolutely serve in this capacity i sent that email on august 14th um and i also gave you know very outlined opportunities i even said let me know i'm happy to make myself available um and i got no response whatsoever um about any of this being approved or activated uh and, and in fact um the one response i got down the line was you know we're going to move forward with the commission so 
on August 19th, that following week on that Wednesday, um, was the first Policing Policy Commission meeting. Just before that, um, that week before that, there was also an email sent that had a request out to all the members of the commission to um, prioritize, that's the best way to say it, which of the three committees they wanted to serve on. Now, when I accepted, you know, this understanding that the commission was going to take place and the mayor laid out the three committees, I had the, the assumption that the commi commission members would have an opportunity to serve in all capacities uh, in forms of this commission. That's not the case. Every member of the commission has been assigned one of the three committees to serve on. Um, many of us, I believe, got our, you know, first selection and pick here, um, but at, for obvious reasons, and I'm saying obvious because I think many of the board members would feel the same way here, and I think the community would, the COB and the COB's representatives should not be on one third of this commission, should not be engaged in one third uh, of, of the work being done, not to mention that every single committee uh, that will be working and reviewing data is able to do so because of the staff, the MNCO staff, the COB staff that is working diligently over time to get this information uh, and make it uh, available. And so I sent another email and I made it very clear that the COB should not be positioned so that the only way we can be effective is in these silos, that this is in no way what either the community had in mind, the board had in mind, but specifically it gets away from the purpose of this commission. Um, and then I also reiterated that yes, because you have 40 people, I get it, a 40 person WebEx meeting is a lot of people, but I also know that this is important. So here's another solution on how this could possibly work. Um, that was met with uh, a response of, of, well, actually we're going to still move forward with the, co the committee. So that was declined as well. On August 19th, when the first policy, uh, policing policy commission meeting was, um, was convened, it was opened with remarks by Mayor Cooper, uh, followed by extraordinary uh, remarks by our executive director, Fitcher, uh, then followed by remarks by interim chief Drake. And then uh, in the end, there were um, remarks by Mayor Carl Dean. Uh, Mayor Car Carl Dean and Judge Dinkins have been uh, identified as the co-chairs of the committee. Uh, Mayor Carl Dean, however, was the only speaker on uh, Wednesday, last Wednesday, August 19th, because Judge Dinkins is currently unavailable uh, to serve on uh, the commission and uh, does not have a date currently on when he will be available um, to serve due to health. And Mayor Cooper and Mayor Dean's comments, however, um, gave the impression that Judge Dinkins was actually uh, expected to be a part of this and be a co-chair of this. Um, I think it's very, very important, very important to be very honest at all times, to be transparent in this space. I was very honest with John Button uh, and Eric Brown by email on Sunday, on August 23rd, and then also by phone with John Button yesterday about the problems that are, are quite apparent to me about not just the composition of this, this commission, but also the way that it's working, the way that it's, it's going about its business. Because there was an email sent by uh, Mayor Carl Dean to the members of the commission asking all of us, the 40 per plus people on this commission, to email him directly if we wanted to uh, serve as a chair of one of the committees. I emailed the, the entire group and said that I think that uh, respectfully it would be more appropriate that we wait until we get into our committees and then have more of a democratic process so that everyone can understand who's interested and decide who could best lead the committee. Um, since that time, I didn't get a response back to that email. However, I have seen an email in the last hour and a half or so from uh, Mayor Carl Dean saying that he has now adopted that and they will choose the leaders of the, uh, the chairs of the committee in that way. Um, my conversation with John Button yesterday um, was as straightforward as it could be. I reiterated that it's very troubling um, uh, the, the way that they are putting, they put this commission together in a way that uh, one does not clearly, in my opinion, reflect the purpose of this commission. Uh, to be very frank with you, uh, this, this commission is over 50% white men. We know without a doubt, excuse me, it's over 55% people who are not of color. 
is 40 percent white men and we know from the stats left and right that it, whether it's driving while black or other uh components of, of uh, studies whether it's nationally or locally that that is not the demographic that is being uh that is disproportionately impacted by policing strategies that need to be improved therefore the reflection of this committee should in this committee commission should be reflective of that as well and we should not be siloed in this way right and so just just for awareness and i'm going to wrap up very cleanly here um when i think about the the purpose of this commission how we as a board decided and voted to be a part of it i feel it's important for you to know i emailed and, and made it very clear to john button to share that the COB should be leading and not riding shotgun in this with this committee commission um that there is certainly uh, an importance for not breaking us down, uh, especially the COB, into one third of this commission so that we can actually be effective, that right away there needs to be trans representation um, without a doubt due to, just just to be honest with you, over over 68% per, per of trans respondents last year said that they have been mistreated at some time, uh, point within the last year with their interaction with police. So we know that there's a space here where their voice needs to be uplifted. Um, and I also made it very clear, too, also that all of these meetings, every single meeting, needs to be live streamed so that the com community can be a part of it and not hear about it secondhanded. Um, my com comments were met with, um, well, we're really regretful that you feel that way. Um, we feel that this commission is a temporary thing and that the COB should, in essence, we should continue to do our thing, you know, which is our everyday piece. Um, we, we, we very much disagree on that point. And I can deal with dissenting opinions, but what I cannot be comfortable with as your chair, or just a member of this board, is, is a space where everyone is not uh, involved and aware of what the true essence of something that we agree to be a part of. So I'll pause here with my Marks, I'll take questions uh, or comments if there are any, um, but I am concerned. Uh, and I've asked uh, John Button to do uh, some diligent understanding and reach out to determine if and when Judge Dinkins will be available to serve as co-chair of this commission, because the idea of Mayor Carl Dean being the sole co-chair of this uh, commission is problematic at best. It is not appropriate, and we know that there is a way where there could be partnership, where the COB is partnering with Mayor Carl Dean and Judge Dinkins, if that be the opportunity to get this work done. So I'll pause here, answer any questions, but I simply wanted to offer that space for everyone to know exactly what's taken place over the last just two to three weeks. Mr. Campbell Gooch. So I just I just have a clarifying question um, because I know I know I saw the mayor presented to the minority caucus, uh, which is chaired by uh, Councilmember Sharon Hurt, and there was a question about uh, the only council member being on the commission was uh, Councilmember Pulley, and so there was a question about how to get somebody from the minority caucus on uh the commission and the response from the mayor was um keep it one council member because uh the same and i think this goes for the same reasoning behind keeping one uh cob member is because they didn't want to have to deal with the open meetings um and having it become a quote-unquote media frenzy but my question is, is that if the subcommittees are of the if the commission's subcommittees are separate and essentially working in their own silos, then it seems like there should be able to be multiple community oversight board members and multiple uh, city council members because they would be working separately. I'm not sure if I'm reading that correctly. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I think you, you're spot yeah. on. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right, and and it goes even further now, Mr. Kavagush, because uh, earlier this afternoon I was made aware. Ms. Uh, Mayor Cooper announced that 
Councilwoman Gamble will be joining the commission. And so now it's automatically the bell is rung with more than one member of the city council, you know, our council uh, membership being a part of it, um, which does ring the bell of the Open Meetings Act. And also begs the question on my end, and why they cannot add and will not add a member of the transgender community. Um, when they were telling me, they told me that the commission's already large or big. Um, I came to them. So um, it, there shouldn't be that problem anymore. Um, there should be an ability to add two, three, four of us for that matter, because um, it's no longer an issue. We're not trying to avoid that anymore. Thank you for that, Chair. And then another clarifying point, um, it, so what are the three different co subcommittees working on? I know one is, I mean, I'm not sure what they work on. So I'm just curious about like, what are the three different, are there three different topics or is each subcommittee working on everything at once? Yeah, no, great question. Let me um, let me be as specific as I can here um, because one of them was just renamed this afternoon. The, excuse me, there is the, Policies, Tactics, and Training Committee. Uh, there's also the um, serving, so let me just say what Policies, Tactics, and Training is going to be looking at national best practices as it relates to, um, um, of course, the policy component, but they also said that they're gonna look at how they engage residents uh, um, and minimize likelihood, the likelihood of force being used the safeguards that are used to minimize uh, 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 force when serving warrants, and also uh, related to body-worn camera policy uh, and comparing what we currently have to that of uh, best practices around the nation. Um, that, that group will also look at um, to what extent does MMPD use military-grade equipment or military tactics. Um, so that's just some of that, that focus of that group. The, there's another group also that looks at serving Nashville's community communities, or that's what it, it's titled as. That looks at engagement or interaction with people with mental illness, um, those that are engaging with Metro schools, so the youth, uh, an opportunity to look at homeless, those are experienced homelessness, uh, juveniles and vulnerable, other vulnerable populations. And then also um, there's the neighborhood engagement strategies as a whole, as it relates to addressing crime. Uh, and then last but not least, this last one was just renamed. It's called Screening, Supervision, Resources, and Recruitment. Um, but they say now that they're going to name it, um, excuse me, it's going to be called the, the, the Workforce Committee. And it's looking at uh, recruitment, uh, recruitment tactics uh, to improve diversity numbers in terms of race, gender, et cetera. Um, departmental procedures, recording, as it relates to recording complaints of use of force, and how well does MMPD attract and retain talent? Um, there has been no, <clears throat> there's been no like specific breakdown beyond the, the longer memo that was sent out um, and the request for you to select one of three uh, committees. That, that's that been the most that, that we've gotten from that. Sorry for the long answer there. Uh, thank you for that, Chair. It, that cleared up a lot for me. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts here? Okay. If, if not, and I'll keep scrolling here if there's a raised hand, or feel free to unraise here. Um, Ms. Campbell-Guth, I see you raised, so feel free to unmute if you still do have um, something else to say uh, there. I um, want us to be very uh, clear here. I, uh, Ms. Campbell-Guth, are, are you unmuted? Yeah, I was just. Okay. So, I was, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna I ask. Right, right. I was just gonna ask um, you, chair, and then also other uh, COB, uh, other COB members, if this new information or this new board structure changes um, how we strategically engage in this commission. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I welcome other uh, thoughts here. Mr. Hughes, I see you're unmuted. Feel free. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I did have a clarifying question, uh, very similarly to what was presented or, or kind of alluded to by Mr. Campbell Gooch. Uh, I do have a question as it relates to the current composition of this board 
specifically as it relates to representation for individuals from impacted communities. Can we get a clearer uh, understanding? I know that you wrote down, Madam Chair, just a few of the details for the current uh, board, but could you give me uh, those restrictions again? I want to make sure that I have an accurate depiction in my notes before I ask my question. Sure, yeah, you, I, sure, as far as the breakdown of uh, people of color and the breakdown there, like I shared there? That is correct, ma'am. Okay, let me, and, and you all, by the way, let me know if any way I'm, I'm breaking up or I'm not clear here. Um, the, the count I have on my end, there are 16 white men on this commission, six uh, white women, uh, 18 uh, people of color. I'm happy to break down in that space too, uh, a male, female, the breakdown, but that was, for me, 16, six, and then 18. Uh, I have a uh, 55% to 45%, of course, of it, as far as that is concluded, um, at, as far as those numbers are uh, regarding. And then from that too, I was looking at breakdown of just um, uh, different sectors of our, our communities that were represented as far as those in academia and other spaces as well. But that that's the, the assessment I have. And that doesn't include the addition of Councilwoman Gamble, I believe, uh, who was just announced this afternoon, or today, rather. That's helpful, uh, Madam Chair. I was, uh, I was curious about the representation specifically for individuals who are otherly able, and so I'm not sure if those numbers are available, but individuals who may be in the hard of hearing or perhaps the, um, the, uh, the communities uh, represented by individuals who might be sight impaired and have other, uh, uh, face other differences in, in ability. I raise that question specifically, Chair, because uh, the concern that I have is that as we are talking about these issues of disproportionate contact, I want to make sure that we are continuing to raise uh, issues related to otherly abled or have other vulnerabilities uh, in lieu of and connected to in some ways what we are seeing uh, it kind of acted out in, in certain moments in, in this particular a historic moment, we are seeing that there are individuals who might have uh, particular distress, individuals who might have uh, be in mental distress, who are having interactions with police officers in those situations, ultimately leading to an individual being either uh, injured or potentially a life being taken. And so I want to make sure that we're centering the voices and the concerns of those who might be from particularly marginalized and vulnerable communities, particularly those who might uh, have uh, certain other abilities or challenges that they face that may not necessarily be represented in the demographic data. So I, I did just have a, a question specifically regarding that, but I, I will say also um, that I find it also a little bit concerning that there seems to be uh, a willingness to be flexible around certain um, expectations, rules, understanding as it relates to certain elements of this commission, but a rather uh, kind of stringent and inflexible perspective in others. I, I wonder if there is a similar sentiment from other members of the board, and if there is uh, some, some similar concern around that, if we could give voice to what those concerns might be, and I, I yield my time. Thank you, Mr. Hughes, I appreciate it. I, I just to answer your question quickly, I, I'm not aware of uh, the representation from uh, that um, particular community, but I hope that there was intentionality behind that too, because we identified that in our letter as well. And I can uh, look into that. I think that's a, a, a meaningful, purposeful question there. Um, if they, the representation is lacking there as well. Um, I, I know that uh, Mr. Kemagooch also asked a question here of the board, if there were thoughts uh, and feelings here. Uh, and, and look, I, in the end, like all things here, if, if the position here is that we are comfortable of moving forward and continue to be a member of this commission, I will continue to, to, to do so uh, dutifully. But I also believe um, without a doubt that there needs to be a, a true answer as to whether or not this is a commission with already stated objectives uh, and, and results before any committee has met. And, and that's what's concerning me. Um, is that it is not as trans transparent and community focused and engaged as it needs to be. And it's something where I just can't in good conscience have the COB be a member and a part of this unless we have some true and real answers to this. Um, but that is just my speaking here. Mr. Question. 
<clears throat> you talked about the committees being siloed. How do you understand that this is supposed to work? Are each of those committees just going to work totally independently and make some kind of report? Or are they going to gather information and then there's going to be meetings of the commission? Or what is, what is kind of the functional operations as you understand them at this point? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Sweeney. It's a good question. Uh, I don't know if I was clear about that. Uh, I asked that same question. The current plan is for the committees to just meet separately. For their to, there's never any. There hasn't been at least stated any plan for, let's say, committee chair of workforce to then meet also with the committee chair and vice chair of another committee. Or you know that that has not been stated. I suggested that in my August 14th email uh, that perhaps to get around or to uh, to at least address. Um, concerns about all of this work happening in these individual pockets that uh, two members from each committee along with the two co-chairs could meet on a weekly basis or whatever you know fr frequency is necessary to make sure that we're sharing information back and we're also receiving information uh, that was met with silence as well I didn't get a response on that I haven't seen any communication that that will be adopted, and I'm concerned about that um, because I, my fear also, again, is is that um, Committee A won't know anything that's going on in Committee C, and what if we put something together in the dark that doesn't actually fit in the end and when we come back together? Um, but I don't, I haven't gotten an answer to that. I'm not. Mr. Sweeney, Goddard? Uh, yes, I'm going to, uh, Chair Davis, I appreciate all you're saying. Don't take my remarks as, as pushing back on any of that. I'm going to jump all the way to the end of the process and ask a question or make a couple of comments. I, I think we work the best deal we can with this committee. I think if we can get on all the committee subcommittees, that's great. If we can't, we try to strike an alliance with folks that can to have our desires heard. But at the end of the day, however successful or unsuccessful we are, I believe this commission is going to have a lot to say about police procedures and make a lot of decisions about that. And to the extent those decisions are in areas we want to follow up on later, it's going to make, make our job more difficult. I think at the end of the day, whatever this is, we need to find the way to participate the most effectively we can. Stated differently, I don't see, a, I don't see how it makes sense for us to sit this out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. I appreciate it. And, and appreciate the perspective too. Mr. Sweeney, are you still unmuted there? Um, yes, um, and I, I agree with um, Mr. Goddard that we need to have a voice in this and I appreciate the way that you have regularly um, made the point through the mayor's office and that we should continue to do that I think the idea of making alliances with people on the other subcommittees is a great idea if you are not successful in, in um, having meetings that um, combine um, the discussions of the work being done by the three committees. Um, I, I do think that it's important for us to have a voice here even if we have to amplify that voice separately from things that the board does, if we don't think we're being heard clearly enough through the committee. I understand, thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Is there any additional comments, questions here on this? If not, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Um, so I was curious, um, I, just, I do think it makes sense for us to like spread out into these committees. I think that is a like tremendous opportunity. Um, and I think it also safeguards us from having our work constantly duplicated over and over again as a technique to mobilize efforts. Um, so I'm just curious about, uh, Chair, how do you think we could go about getting on those separate subcommittees just to make sure like the people's process that created this board is also thoroughly represented represented on this commission. Yeah, no, I, um, 
I <clears throat> look. I've made uh, the request here by email. There has been no official press release. We've done nothing uh, publicly because, quite frankly, I didn't. To be honest with you, I thought it was such a um, common sense request of of not just wanting the COB to be involved, but this being something that the mayor said he wants the, the community to feel a part of and engaged. Um, but, you know, my I'd love to hear from other members of the board on this, if it's um, sharing this press release so that it's very publicly stated what and why we're making this request um, for representatives to be add, added. I think that would be great. And I'm sure the board, we could ready additional people to step into those roles. Um, and I, I'll yield here because I see Mr. Martinez here raised as well. Perhaps he has ideas and then I see Mr. Sweeney. I just wanted to agree that we can't sit this one out and maybe we, or if, if I think we should be uh, advocating more for, for more representation on not only the community's behalf, but our behalf as well on each of the committees. And if we can't get, you know, more diverse community members on the committees and the, on the commission, then perhaps we can aim to, you know, serve and those communities and, you know, make it pointed effort to meet with them to make sure that we represent their point of view at these different committee meetings. All right, Mr. Martinez, so I'm clear. So I think you're echoing the same sentiments of we uh, go the approach of getting alignment there on ideas here, but maybe the first part is to make the formal request that we uh, have additional members added there. Am I, am I right about that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sweeney and then Ms. Ross. Are the committees going to be staffed? And if so, staffed by whom? Do we have the ability to influence the three committees through our staffing of the committee? Uh, my understanding is they will be staffed by a member um, the mayor's uh, team. I know that uh, John Button and Eric uh, Brown will be at these meetings, but there's also uh, a lady whose name, her name escapes me, who's been sending out that. Uh, calendar invites and was in charge of uh, coordinating kind of uh, what the preferences were for each member of the commission. So I, I do think that, that they will be, in fact, staffed. It sounds that way. By, by staffing, I meant providing substantive information to the committees for their consideration and, and you know, coming up with agendas and questions and issues. Yeah, it, it sounds it sounds like there's a mixture of the kind of they're playing both both sides, both the coordination logistics, but also substantively. And then, of course, um, Director Fitcher can kind of speak to this too. Um, uh, Dr. Blair and, and and others have been helpful in that space too. Um, am I right about that, Executive Director Fitcher, as far as the the data side of, of things? Sorry. Um, yes. Um, um, Dr. Valier has been in contact with Mr. Bunt and what, you know, in regards to this commission more than I have. And so if he wants to jump in and speak more about what his role has been, that would be helpful. Yeah, sure. There's, um, I have had several conversations with Mr. Bunton as well as I yesterday met Dia Cirillo, who is um, a policy analyst or policy person from the health department who's working with the mayor's office. And we have set up weekly meetings going forward for the next few weeks while the commission is happening in order to talk um, throughout, uh, throughout about helping identify subject matter experts and other issues as they come up and hopefully helping to shape the process. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sweeney, does that answer your question? Um, in part. Um, okay. So in the sense that the um, mayor's office doesn't have expertise, which is what's been my understanding throughout this process, and that's how we played a role in this, that to the extent 
we can use our resources in order to um, develop the issues and develop the questions and provide the resources for consideration that might very appropriately give us the ability to magnify our influence by by demonstrating the ability and expertise that we have to the committee members who uh, likely will have very limited information themselves and therefore we can help to influence the process not just by our membership but by strategic um, uh, roles um, on the staff side. I understand, Mr. Sweeney. We can look in, into that. I mean, it, certainly if they're amenable to it, we can certainly look at that in, in capacity wise, too. Uh, Ms. Ross? Okay, I want to basically echo much of what Mr. Sweeney has said and Mr. Gooch and Martinez. I'm very concerned about the diversity community uh, members, the lack of it. And I think that we need to be representative on each of the three committees and we may have to use our community voice and with the uh, press release um, to get back in from the community and supporting us and being on these uh, committees. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Mr. Uh, Campbell Gooch. Um, um, I have uh, two or three questions that I'm going to get out the way. Um, first, I'm, Chair, you mentioned a timeline. So if this is not going to be a permanent board, but they have a lot of information that they have to source through, they're also going to have to figure out how to be able to build consensus amongst these three groups, and then they're also going to have to figure out how to have a collective analysis without building any type of like team effort. Um, and so I'm just curious, if this is not a permanent commission, how long um, is the commission going to be standing up? Uh, my understanding, Mr. Campbell-Gooch, is that um, the focus of this commission uh, or the you know length of time is supposed to be at mid to late October. The mayor uh, and Director Fitcher can correct me if I'm wrong, but from the mayor's remarks and previous statements in the uh, press release, it seems that he's expecting a report um, by the middle of uh, October so that it would then inform the chief of police search. Is that your understanding, Director Fitcher? Yeah, that's my understanding, but I think that Peter has some more knowledge. I'm sorry, Dr. Malir has some more knowledge in regards to the report that we had a, a, a really quick discussion about it today. And so um, if you want to update them about the report, that would be great. Um, as far as the policy commission, um, their work should be concluding uh, toward the end of October with public release of the full report. And, but it seems as the initial plan is to have quite a bit of the work done by the, by the beginning of October so that it will inform the um, hiring of the new police chief and have questions prepared for police chief candidates. On the research that we're doing as MMCO and um, which will include uh, some policy recommendations, that will go before the board before it gets released publicly. And so the work that we, any work that we do, that if there's um, specific policy recommendations, all of our bylaws, we're following our own process um, to bring that to the board before anything goes public from our side. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Mr. Campbell-Gooch. I was going to say thank you. I think they cleared um, a bunch up for me. Um, and I will also be remiss if I did not mention the this type of like closed door, um, back room, um, 
like maneuvering around public meetings is the reason why uh, this body was created in the first place. I, I had to, I wanted to make sure I said that on record. And then also, um, and I proposed this question to some of my uh, friends who are also on the commission, is how do we bring our people along? So it's just like, how do we bring, if none of this is happening on the record, um, and even the FOP members and the police um, members on the commission are not willing to go on public record and talk about um, the issues within MNPD. How do we then inform community members and our people about the things that they're curious about? If no one is willing to be open, honest, and vulnerable and on the record in front of our people's eyes, how can we then bring them along to the information that they need to know? Mr. Kamaguchi, at the, at the very least, any member of the COB that's a part of these committees should report back um, to the larger body. And if that means those notes also, you know, maybe it's not to be arduous here, maybe we post these also on the on the uh, website um, because there should be no conversation taking place in these meetings that the community cannot be privy to and a part of. Um, you have a 40 plus person commission there's, there, I mean, first of all, it, it's going to be shared anyway, and it should be. Um, my request has been that these meetings be live streamed the same way the opening remarks by the mayor and, you know, Director Fitchett and others in that opening space was live streamed and recorded. And it's totally feasible to do. And now, now, quite frankly, with two members of the city council on there, it's possible. And look, I, I don't want to belabor us here. I know we spent a, a great time of our, our meeting here. I want to be very clear. I'm not. I'm not simply saying. I'm not saying. Look, let's just pull out of participating in this commission. However, I do believe that we need to make it very clear that our participation needs to be community centered, and that includes live streamed uh, meetings. That there be a representative from the trans community, and there shouldn't be any reason anymore why they can't do that, especially when they've added someone today and they have a list of names of people to consider. And I also believe that there should be at least a max, a minimum of two active co-chairs. And they to be respectful and honest about the fact that if Judge Dinkins is not available, which is absolutely uh, understandable, that they be honest with the community versus uh, using uh, Judge Dinkins' name in a way that makes it seem as though he's being actively engaged with the work that Carl Dean, Mayor Carl Dean is, is leading. Uh, and so, I'm, again, okay with dissenting opinions. If we decide to move forward without at least stating these minimum concerns here, that's fine, too, um, and we can move forward with this agenda. But I did want to be very clear here that what was shared out, you know, by press release and maybe even what we've heard in the media is not, in fact, what is actually being activated currently with this commission. Um, and unless there's additional comments here, I'll, I'll simply move forward here. Um, Mr. Dr. Hildreth, Mr. Martinez, and then Mr. Swinkle. Thank you, Chair Davis. Um, I appreciate and respect and echo the comments that have been made by many of the board members. So I will hone in on a point that Member Campbell Gooch just raised, and that was about our origin statement. The reason why the Community Oversight Board was created by the people through a charter amendment was to do the very serious work of police oversight, work that became important because the people determined that the executive branch of government, the mayor's office, had fundamentally and systemically failed in that job. We have a tremendous mandate. We have our own power. And I am terribly concerned that we may be falling for a distraction. We are 50 minutes into this meeting. There has been a significant police-involved event in this community. I know that there's quite a bit left in the agenda. And we're talking about basically a committee. Let's, let's call it what it is. It's a working committee 
that the mayor's office has assembled to receive information to do its job. Our job remains. If we wanna make sure that community voices are heard, we can continue to invite community to both these public meetings and also the listening sessions that we had, one of which was Monday, I joined late, but I do know that persons came in. We can always carry the community's voice around these issues. I am for supporting and participating in this body because there is the possibility as member Sweeney has mentioned and others that we might be able to leverage and combine and do great work together. I would still hold open the possibility that if this board determines that that committee has not done great work, then we can address it through the rules, regulations, procedures that we are continuing to hone. So I am for continued participation. I'm, I'm for raising all reasonable suggestions. I'm also for understanding that if those suggestions are not met, that we look at our own toolbox and uh, seek remedies that are within the power that the people gave us. So that would be my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zildjian. Mr. Uh, Mr. Martinez. Mr. Martinez. Sorry, I didn't unmute. I would also point out that I think many of the members of the commission are, I think, are on our side, support our work. So I think that is something that we can leverage in, you know, reaching out to them individually to express our concerns to them about the mission that they're involved in so that they in turn can also put pressure on uh, the mayor's office to increase the diversity of the commission and to you know, increase our representation on committees as well. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Thank you uh, to everyone as well. Oh, uh, I appreciate um, all the comments here. Make sure I didn't, if I missed any, I don't believe I did. So please unmute, I'm happy to uh, acknowledge you here. Sorry if I did. Um, we can move forward. Uh, Dr. Pickard, um, I don't, if there are no more comments here, and I, just so I'm clear here about we move forward, we'll continue with our engagement here at this level. Uh, we'll come back together, have a report on the progress thus far, and then the board can uh, assess um, the progress and determine how we move forward, and, and we'll do just that. And I'll keep you updated as well by email um, through, of course, Director Fitchard if there's anything new to share. Um, we'll move uh, forward here. Director Fitchard uh, has uh, Interim Chief uh, Drake joined us yet, or should we go to your report? Yes, we should go to my report. I haven't heard from him. There has been some type of um, major accident involving a, um, a, a, a community or a citizen and a, an MMPD officer. And so I'm not really sure if um, interim um, Deputy Chief Drake will um, be able to attend the meeting. Um, he was headed, um, he, he um, notified me that he was heading to um, Vanderbilt Hospital. So um, I will just um, wait for him to respond, but we can move forward on um, the executive director report if you guys are ready. That would be great, thank you. Okay. So the executive director's report, and I'm gonna move through this pretty swiftly since we have a lot of things to get to. Um, so um, I'm gonna just touch on the most significant items here. Um, when we go down to the MNC personnel update, we have had an investigator resign as of Friday, August 21st. Um, Assistant Director Clausey has worked with Metro HR to get that position vacancy approved and publicly noticed. And so that will be coming in the next few weeks. Um, MNCO has been spending time training. We are involved in the virtual 2020 NACO annual conference. That conference is 32 webinars, I'm sorry, webinars, and they began on July 20th. They'll end on September the 22nd. 
We also attended a two-day training that was hosted by the Nashville Conflict Resolution Center, and it was on legacy of trauma, the development, the de developmental trauma of African Americans, and it was really good. And we appreciate the Nashville Conflict Resolution Center including us in that. Um, as for community outreach, um, Ms. Thompson, our community liaison, has worked, um, has been working with the Metro Human Relations Commission. Um, and we had our first um, community outreach session or town hall, I'm sorry, on Monday. And so for the community forum number two, that will be next Monday, the 31st from 5 to 6.30 p.m. And we are interested in hearing from the community's um, survivors of domestic violence and trafficking, victims' rights advocates, and mental health communities. Um, but of course, the forums are open to all Nashville residents. And the forum information is posted on our website and social media platforms. Um, as it pertains to complaints and contacts, we received a total of four investigative complaints and assisted with 30 non-complaint calls since the last board meeting in July. Two of those complaints were received this week. So it increased from two on your report to four. Um, and so for the month of, for the month of August. Um, as for the research, um, I believe Dr. Valier, I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Valier, um, he requested the use of force reports. The research team received the documents um, since the last board meeting in July. MMPD sent the requested use of force records to the DA's office for approval and release. And the records for cases with juvenile information is still under review. Um, I want to talk a little bit about there was a homeless man jailed for a mask mandate violation that happened on Thursday, August the 6th. Um, I received several calls from concerned community members about the arrest of a black elderly homeless man on Broadway Avenue in downtown Nashville. He was alleged to not have complied with the public health department's mask ordinance. I reached out to District Attorney General Glenn Funk and Chief Public Defender Martisa Johnson to get more information and to express the community's outrage of the second arrest of a homeless person for issues that were related to the Metro Health Department's ordinances. Um, also, you know, I raised concern with them about what appeared to be selective and biased enforcement of the mask mandate on Broadway Avenue. Um, and I also requested that MMPD send me all the roll call trainings, which are policies um, related to the Metro Health Department's mass mandate. And I did receive those from Deputy Chief Mike Hager. Um, as for the proposed resolution reports, um, the PR committee met on August the 3rd to review and discuss the proposed resolution report format and process. And member Sean Witzel was chair of that committee and I'd like him to give the board a brief update. Member Witzel? Hello, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, um, on August 3rd, I chaired, um, I chaired that particular, um, sorry, I'm having some tech issues. Um, I, I chaired that committee and we created, um, basically we went through the process of looking at the, um, and reviewing the PRR draft and, um, and the SOPs. And we basically kind of went through that and just um, like asked questions and developed it a little more. And we offered like our full support from myself and the rest of the board um, and on what the board, on what was decided upon. And that's pretty much all I all I have to offer the board is just uh, that committee was um, in full support of where we ended and, and moving forward. Thank you. Appreciate that. And so the executive committee on August the 10th, we had our executive committee meeting and they received a mock PRR and investigation sample to review and provide feedback. The executive committee and myself discussed the reports and next steps in preparation for presentation to the full board, which is what we'll do today. Um, the executive committee approved and the proposed resolution report design and format. 
and I, we believe that we will be ready to present um, proposed resolution reports to the board in September. As for the body worn and in car camera update, the West Precinct installed it began on July the 27th and they are continuing and or are ahead of schedule. 32 West Precinct cars have had um, in, ca in car camera installs. Um, there's approximately 33 cars that remain. 53 West Precinct officers have been issued cameras. Approximately 40 remain. And the next precinct on the list is the East Precinct for implementation of body-worn cameras. Um, I wanted to say I spoke on August the 13th um, they, with, with a gentleman by the name of Mr. Gary Peterson. He is the lead consultant for the search um, of the hiring of the new Metro Nashville Police Department chief. Um, he and I discuss the process, the relationship of the COB with MMPD and overall policing practices. Um, I was invited and attended a meeting for the Criminal Justice Steering Committee that happened on Monday, August the 17th. Um, and we actually were addressed by Mayor Cooper. We discussed upcoming initiatives and priorities, COVID-19, Nashville arrest trends in the jail population. I want to mention that there was a death in custody on Monday, August the 17th. I got a call from Captain Jason Starling, who's the commander of the Criminal Investigations Division. Um, and he stated that a man had died while in custody of the Davidson County Sheriff's Office. The MMPD code case unit was notified of the death, as is the established procedure to investigate the occurrence. Captain Starling also contacted the DA's office and TBI and stated that there were no preliminary indications that MMPD was involved. Um, an investigation by the code case unit is open and an autopsy will be performed and by the medical examiner, excuse me. And I don't have any further follow up information as of yet on that. Um, moving to the subpoena ordinance, um, on Tuesday, August 18th, the Metro Council um, Council member Bob Mendez sponsored, along with 14 co-sponsors, Bill BL 2020-401 to set up the process of the COB requesting subpoenas through the Metro City Council. It passed the first reading. It will head to the second reading during the next City Council meeting, which is on Tuesday, September the 1st, 2020. Um, I want to talk a little bit now about the MMPD search warrant rate, MMPD, MDHA search warrant rate. On Wednesday, August the 19th, um, Interim Chief John Drake contacted me about a search warrant that was served on an MDHA resident and the decommissioning of several MMPD officers. He stated that because of this incident, the policy for search warrant approval had changed and that a press conference was going to happen shortly after that phone call. He confirmed that, um, and then I confirmed that we were also investigating that issue. And then additionally, I received the updated roll call training um, policy change entitled Search Warrant Approval Required Revision from Deputy Chief Mike Hagar. Um, I think during our last, it was during our emerging, I'm sorry, executive committee, um, the, the executive committee had said that we needed to reach out to Metro Human Resources and those different agencies, those partner agencies in regard to some uh, an anonymous letter that um, one of the members of our board had received. And so I reached out to Metro Human Resources as well as Metro Human Relations Commission. I also spoke with MMPD's um, Human Resources and Assistant Director Clausey spoke with the Office of Professional Accountability and everyone was really helpful. And I think that the common theme here was that Metro HR is willing to work with all of the partner agencies and working with E.D. Fitchard and A.D. Clausey toward finalizing a clear and direct path going forward to address the needs of Metro employees um, and give them options on how to file complaints regarding the violation of civil rights um, under Title VII. Um, I also reached out to Metro, I'm sorry, to Metro Department Housing Authority, MDHA, Executive Director Jim Harbison, to discuss issues related to MDHA's policies regarding residents' pri privacy concerns that were voiced um, to me. And so he and I um, talked about 
um, some you know issues that were, was happening at MDHA. And he stated that he took steps, <coughs> excuse me, to make certain that residents feel safe in their apartments and that he has enacted a new policy excuse me, that will ensure keys will no longer be made available to MMPD without his personal approval, even with a search warrant. Um, additionally, he said he's gonna send out messaging to residents informing them of his new policy and procedures, and that he has a meeting scheduled with interim chief Drake to discuss the relationship between his residents and MMPD. He also asked would I would, would, if I would agree to meet soon to continue conversations that would benefit the community members who reside in, in DHA properties. And of course, I agreed. Um, and then the last thing here is a records meeting. Um, we had, uh, I, myself and A.D. Clausey had a scheduled meeting about records with Legal Director Bob Cooper, District Attorney General Glenn Funk, and Deputy Chief Mike Hagar. That meeting was set for August the 24th, but there was some type of conflict scheduling. And so it was postponed until Tuesday, September 1st at 2 p.m. And that concludes my director's report. And I'll take questions. Thank you, Director Fitcher. Any questions uh, for Director Fitcher? Thank you. Report, um, just wanna make sure I'm very clear. Don't see any uh, questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, I had a question um, about MDHA. Do you know if they have a MOU with MMPD? They do have a they do have an MOU with with um, MDHA regarding security. Um, for with officers i don't know all, i have it and i have read it but i just can't recall all the details of it but there is an there is a there is a mou between mdha and mmpd it does not include releasing of the keys and of course as you i'm sure everyone has heard um, Mr. Harbison, and he made certain that I, you know, was aware that the data sharing of information um, with with information from MDHA residents to police officers that he stopped that practice in 2017 or 18, so it, around that time, um, because he said that he wasn't aware when he took on the position that there was this data sharing that had been set up and in place, but it is no longer happening. Thank you. Uh, any additional questions here or any, any topics of the report? Now, I thank you very much, Director Fitcher. Uh, if if uh, Chief Interim Chief Drake is able to join us, we certainly welcome him for the conversation um, and we'll pause uh, appropriately. Uh, let's move to the MOU finalization uh, discussion. Director Fitcher. Chief Drake said that he's headed into the meeting now. Okay. So can we pause for a moment? Sure. So, he, so he's signing on. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Okay. Great. It's perfectly fine. The um, so uh, once um, uh, the interim chief Drake uh, has shared remarks here, if there are any questions from the board. We'll then uh, move back in order and uh, go next to the MOU finalization discussion, and we'll, we'll stay in order the, the agenda here. Um, Director Fitcher, uh, will he he has a panelist uh, uh, link? I'm assuming he'll join us as a panelist. We'll see. Him. He was sent it as a panelist, but he just said he was scowling in. So I just um, okay. I'm try trying to figure out what's going to happen with that. That's. That's not what I was expecting. Um, yeah, he's having a little bit of issues, <clears throat> excuse me, um, getting in. So let me work on that and maybe we can move to um, another portion in the meeting. Um, yep, while that's totally fine. Let's move. So Mr. Pinkley, are you prepared to uh, uh, for the proposed resolution report presentation? Yeah, I can move into that. If you give me just one second to pull it up. Okay, great.
Uh, is everyone able to see the presentation? Yes. Yes, okay. okay. All right, uh, then I'll just uh, head right into it. Uh, so uh, it was a few weeks ago after the uh, resolution report committee meeting, uh, Mr. Sweeney reached out to Jill and I about setting up a training on kind of the background that goes into a resolution report and then the process of creating the resolution report. So uh, this is just a quick uh, background on investigations and then the drafting of the resolution reports. Uh, for those of you uh, who want to review the rules that were passed by the board about the investigations and resolution reports, those are found in the rules of section two. Uh, we've also drafted some standard operating procedures that kind of guide us as we go through this process. Uh, for a standard investigation, what we're going to do is an initial complaint will come in. That complaint will then be assigned to an investigator. That investigator will conduct an, an initial investigation to gather some basic facts about what, what happened in the, uh, in the allegations. Once that initial investigation is complete, uh, there will be a determination on whether or not that complaint is eligible for mediation. Uh, if that complaint is eligible for mediation, we will reach out to the officer and the complainant about whether or not they are interested in participating. In order to qualify for mediation, both parties have to agree that they want to proceed through mediation. Uh, if either party refuses mediation, then it will go to an investigation. Uh, and then our, it'll, our assigned investigator will conduct a full investigation of the entire process. Uh, after that investigation is complete, uh, we will create a proposed resolution report. Uh, that will go through multiple layers of review before it's presented to the board. Uh, once it is presented to the board, it will also come with recommendations for uh, discipline if necessary. And then the board will vote and those recommendations will be forwarded to the uh, Metro Police Department. Uh, every complaint that we get will follow this exact same process. Uh, so in the drafting of the proposed resolution report, uh, Mr. Cooper? Yes. Just one moment. I just want to pause here um, and apologies here. I just want to be uh, thoughtful here because I think um, we have a limited time space here. Uh, Director Fitcher, do we um, do we have uh, Interim Chief Jerry here? Yeah, he says he's in the meeting, but I don't know. He, he called in, so I'm not really sure how to make him a panelist. Um, okay. And so can you do that, Mr. Pinkley? Do you know how to do that? Uh, what is... Uh, can you give me the first three numbers of his phone number? Okay, I will text those to you. Okay. And then I can I can try to add him so that he can speak, although I can't make any promises. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Pingley, but I figured No, no, no that's that's perfectly fine. Your assistance with that. If anybody was gonna help us with that. And to those who are listening in, we are sorry for the interruption. Problem here. I believe uh, Chief Drake has been unmuted. If you can confirm that. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Yes, Welcome. Sure. All right, welcome. Good, good evening and uh, thanks, uh, Director Fitchard, and thank you to uh, members of the COB for allowing me to uh, come into this meeting. Uh, first, I'd like to make a few brief remarks and then uh, join in on some of the discussion or questions that you may have. I, I know you have a, a lot on your agenda and I don't wanna take up uh, too much of your time, but I'm here to be a resource and, and moving forward, we wanna make sure the police department has a uh, person that can come in and uh, whenever you want, and uh, be part of your uh, meetings. Um, I'm here uh, because it's important to have a good relationship with the COB and have a uh, good rapport. Um, I really and truly uh, want this to work and, and really the community expects it to work. They voted for this and it's just, it's 
incumbent upon all of us to make sure that we do what the citizens want and uh, that's for our community. Um, also want a strong relationship with uh, Director Fitcher. I've uh, been reaching out to her on phone calls and trying to make sure that I'm that she knows that I'm sincere about having this rapport and relationship with the COB because I feel it's meaningful and I feel regular meetings in the future will be meaningful as well. Uh, I've talked to Mayor Cooper and he has a strong relationship with all parties involved and he's a strong supporter of the COB as well. And he's encouraged me to reach out to COB and ensure uh, that we have information sharing to the extent permitted by law. And so from what's ever happened in the past, we want to try to get past that uh, and try to get to where we can share uh, information with the COB. There's uh, three things I want to improve on. It's important the COB has access to records so it can do its job to investigate police misconduct. Uh, legal has worked with COB and et cetera on the process to access documents, and we want to improve that process. Um, Bob Cooper will be meeting as an honest broker with Director Fitcher, uh, DA Funk, and uh, Police Chief Mike Hager uh, to have meetings to improve the process and how documents can be shared, and that's already underway, so we're hoping to make some improvement there. Uh, second, a good relationship with the COB with regular meetings. I'm looking to create a liaison with several uh, communities and also the COB. So I'm looking at making a chief diversity officer at some point to where they can connect with uh, community oversight as well as myself, uh, Gideon's Army, NOAA, and, and as well as others uh, to ensure that we have a connection and regular rapport and good rapport uh, with communities. Uh, third, Director Fitcher sent me a copy of the MOU, and uh, it was, came last night. I've been able to review it just a little bit, but not in detail. Uh, but we're looking forward to going over this and negotiating and making sure this works for everyone. And we want to speed this up. I know it's been eight months, and it's been a little bit of, I hear there's some discontent. Uh, but we want to get through this as well so we can move forward with the agenda at hand. And that's taking care of what the citizens uh, voted for. Uh, we also want to be able to just pick up the phone and talk. Uh, I've had things where I just would, would send a text to Director Fitcher or give her a call, and I want her and you all to feel the same way about the police department. Uh, we also want to assist with any investigations as needed, including uh, walking through crime scenes, have someone to escort you the same way we escort the Office of Professional Accountability, to have the same access. Also, uh, we welcome investigations into uh, police conduct. Uh, Mayor Cooper has impaneled a policing commission, and there will be a new chief soon. And I feel the COB and M MMPD should come together to review these recommendations. I know uh, there's some discontent there, but I think even after the commission has their recommendations, I would like uh, to see um, the police department and the COB, as well as maybe the mayor's office as well, come together and review these uh, to make sure that we have the best practices for the 21st century for our citizens. And lastly, uh, I know people are concerned about crime levels as we are. We're always looking at crime and trends, but we also want to make sure we have respectful police officers. Uh, so we are talking the guardian role with the community. I went out this morning to talk to a group of uh, re recruits and um, that was the whole uh, concept of the conversation, talking about guardians and how police officers should be guardians and that we're not at war with anyone, so there's no warrior uh, mentality. And so one of the first things that I've done is we pull it back to flex teams. Flex teams are proactive units that were in communities to suppress crime, but some of the tactics is how we got the driving while black report, uh, pulling over people unnecessarily, going in wholesale neighborhoods and doing the things in the effort to suppress crime, but actually it had uh, unintended consequences. And there's been several other practices that uh, had the same uh, consequences. And so what we've done is we began community engagement teams and changed the whole narrative to having a friendlier police department, a more engaging police department, officers that go and walk through neighborhoods, officers that deliver uh, meals to residents, help tutor kids, help paint basketball courts, help mentor kids and families, and at the same time help uh, problem solve in neighborhood with uh, crime issues. Uh, we've been tutoring, we've had neighborhood cleanups, 
We even had a lady from South Nashville send an email to say that she was just totally ecstatic the way her neighborhood had been cleaned up and that she felt empowered to keep it that way and that she felt like the crime was going away that was inhabited by drugs and prostitution and et cetera. Uh, so with the help of the police department and community engagement, we feel we can work together uh, to make strides in making this community better. And uh, so with that said, I want to thank you all, too, uh, for all you do. Uh, the community voted overwhelmingly to support the Community Oversight Board, and we want to ensure that commitment is realized. So thank you, and uh, I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you, uh, uh, Chief Turk. We appreciate um, you joining us here. We, uh, let me open up here if there's members of the board uh, that would uh, like to speak here. Mr. Holloway, I see you unmuted. Feel free. Yes, uh, Chief Drake, um, on the shooting where the police officer was shot and was walking his dog, there was a 911 call that was made that was denied uh, Miss Fisher. And um, it's a known fact that they, she wouldn't allow those 911 calls. So how can you help her? The, uh, that's going to be a TBI investigation. I would encourage them to call the TBI. We're not privy, and they don't give inf any information out until uh, their investigation is concluded. Uh, that's one thing that actually used to frustrate me just a little bit when they would investigate uh, police officers, and I would want information so I could move a little swifter to uh, uh, make disciplinary or decommission or, or anything moving forward. Uh, but they are real tight lipped. So I would encourage them to contact the TBI and, uh, and tell them uh, what's going on. Thank you. Mr. Sweeney. Yes, thank you, Chair Davis. Um, Chief, it's good to uh, have you with us, and and it's very um, um, positive to hear your comments as far as, as your approach um, in, in the position. Um, in the position. Um, you said that you had received the draft of the MOU and you just got it last night, so you haven't had time to study it, which is understandable. Um, a couple overall questions, though, that um, I hope were clear as you briefly reviewed it. It, it, it. In large part, it's basically talking about parity between the OPA and the COB as far as doing investigations, which is we have the same access to the same documents, we have the same access to the same people, we have the same access to the crime scenes, and we get it all the same way at the same time. Do you agree with that concept? Yes, uh, the, the COB is just like the TBI and OPA, and they should be entitled uh, to information so they can do their investigation. So I do agree with that. And then also access into uh, crime scenes. I uh, discussed that with Deputy Chief uh, Mike Hager. And uh, that's one of the things we're going to ensure as well is when OPA does their walkthrough, then COB has the same right uh, to go through the walkthrough as well. I was able to read over some of that, and there was, uh, you know, no evidence to be disturbed and all that, the same as OPA. And so I can't see why, uh, you know, there's any, uh, any difference in there. Yeah, the reason why I'm asking is because that was one of the major problems or stumbling blocks that we had before, for some reason, COB was not being viewed as performing the same function and having the same rights and having the same access in all ways to an investigation. And the primary purpose of this revised version is to assure that that will now occur. And I understand that you agree with that. Is that correct? Yes, I would definitely read the MOU in detail, but definitely the COB needs to have access to complete its investigations as thoroughly as they need to. And, and this and parity is exactly what's needed for OPA, and there's no reason why COB should uh, stand on the sidelines, so to say, and wait. Uh, it should have the same access to information. Very good. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. 
Thank you. Uh, is there any more questions or comments here from the members of the board? Okay. Now, uh, Drake, we, we thank you for extending your time. Uh, recognize there's quite a bit going on in, in, in the city. So greatly appreciate you dialing in. Um, just want to extend space and time here, Dr. Fitcher, anything on your end as well? Uh, I think uh, Member Campbell Gooch's hand is up. Apologies, I'm sorry. I can't, I don't see that for some reason. Let me, let me yield to, oh, you're all the way at the top of my screen, Mr. Campbell Gooch, sorry about that, please. No, it's all good. And I, I wanted to uh, thank Chief Drake, Interim Chief Drake, for um, acknowledging uh, the changes um, and also acknowledging, like, getting his army in the driving while black report um, and the reforms that he made because of the two. So it leaves me just curious about what other places um, do you see improvement in MMPD? Yeah, thank you for your question. So I see improvements in diversity uh, in total. Uh, we're looking at improving our minorities to have more African Americans, more Latinos, and others that are part of the community, making a very uh, hard push as well for more female officers uh, to have them on the department as well. Uh, if we have more diversity at the lower ranks of officer, we can promote all the way through from sergeant to lieutenant, uh, captain, deputy chief, and chief. Uh, within the police department and have uh, women that are empowered to do uh, that as well. I had a meeting with uh, Don Aaron this morning and we're putting together uh, some information to highlight our women, the women of the Metro National Police Department. We want people to see that. We want people to see uh, African Americans. Uh, we're also uh, making sure that we talk de escalation. De escalation is something that has to be huge. We have to lose uh, the sense of urgency if no one's life is at stake. We have to be able to uh, know that time is on our side. Uh, we have to talk about bias. Uh, we have to look at some of the inherent systemic things that we have uh, from way back that we have to correct. So there's quite a few things that we're working on. I think there's gonna be some good things moving forward for uh, the police department, some changes, and uh, so looking forward to doing that and a lot more. Thank you very much. Any, any additional questions here, Mr. Campbell Gooch? Anything else? Yeah, I just had a I just had a follow up question, um, and I think yeah, thank thank you for that, Chief. That I think that clears up a lot for me, um, and and that leads me to another question. So, what type of um, alternatives to policing, like, do you suggest that could go well with the traditional police force? And the reason that I'm asking that is. One, uh, just to hear what you have to say personally, but also uh, with the community members on the call in mind. Yeah, so so what I think is the, the one thing that we have to look at is quality of life teams for our uh, homeless and displaced uh, communities. We need to look at how uh, we're treating them and, and make sure that we have the officers in place and we that's a team that we started and they can connect uh, individuals with services, uh, whether it's the Salvation Army, uh, whether it's the Homeless Impact Division, and et cetera. Uh, we also have to look at how we have our approach uh, to uh, mental health calls. And sometimes with the uniform, it can escalate uh, calls. We're looking at a mental health team of maybe mobile crisis and uh, plainclothes police officers who can respond uh, to those type of calls to to help those that are in crisis situations and uh, moving forward. Uh, also, we want to be able to look at the systemic things and how we can help uh, those in vulnerable communities where uh, maybe education uh, is uh, hurting or poverty, how we can help uh, with that. And so we're already uh, tutoring kids. We're already starting a mentoring program. Uh, I've talked to Judge Callaway uh, about starting a a program that I'm seriously looking at that would help, would involve the police department, uh, the uh, juvenile court system, uh, the school system, and advocates and others uh, to where we can look at interventions for juveniles. Uh, juvenile crime is on the rise, but there's factors behind it. There are kids that are in uh, unfortunate situations. There are kids that uh, don't have supervision. There are kids that don't have meals. 
And so there's uh, areas that we want to improve on uh, that's non-traditional uh, that we can get out there and work on. So. Thank you, thank you for that, Chief. Uh, and then I just have one more question, uh, and then I'll get out the way. I'm loving this uh, dialogue and this conversation, so I really want to say thank, thank you. I'm extremely grateful. Um, so, also, what type of things could uh, civilians be doing? Are there any like programs that you see happening nationally that are manned by civilians, that, uh, so that our community members could also participate in the safety of their community? Yeah, clergy, uh, we have uh, the ministers who uh, can, you know, I guess come out and work with communities uh, to help build relationships. I've already been speaking to several ministers. Uh, I've talked uh, to Mount Zion and they're wanting to do something to have 50,000 uh, members, uh, maybe sometime in September. Uh, and then also uh, maybe long, uh, kind of off a little bit, uh, but looking at how we investigate our traffic crashes and uh, maybe looking at how civilians can impact that role opposed to police officers so we can focus more on being visible in communities and, and helping others as well. Uh, so I think those are some areas that uh, we can start looking at relatively quickly and then making a bigger impact. Um, I want to make sure that people see us in a different light. Uh, I realize that a lot of the things that we deal with are inherent uh, from 40, 50, 60 years ago, and things that are still occurring today, it, it's really bothersome and troubling to a lot of people. And so it's gonna take a little bit of time to change all that, uh, but we're in it to do it. And we know we can't do it with just police officers and we have to have civilians. Mr. Kambaguchi, any additional questions for follow-up there? No, I want to say thank you for answering those questions. Mm -hmm. so I really do appreciate it. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. So thank you all so much. And if, if you don't have any more, I'm fine. But if you want to have me come back for another meeting or have someone from my staff, we'd love to come back and keep this going and keep building the positive momentum between the police department and the Community Oversight Board. I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure we do what's right by our community. And so I'm 100% I'm in and trying to make that work. And so I wanna say thank you all. Thank you, Chief Drake. We appreciate you. Um, certainly always welcome that, we'll, uh, that, that invite stays open here. Uh, and we'll be sure to communicate ahead of time too, should there be direct uh, explicit questions. But thank you so much for joining us this, this evening. Thank you, um, Chief Drake. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank yep. you so much. Have a great evening. Uh -huh. Bye. You too. Absolutely. Thank you. So we'll, we'll uh, continue forward. Uh, Mr. Pinkley, if you wouldn't mind, if we could pick up on that second slide there. I know you were sharing with us um, uh, the second step, rather, going into the, the next review. If you wouldn't mind picking up right there, that'd be great. Absolutely. Uh, so once... Uh, the con at the conclusion of the investigation, uh, our investigators will prepare what is called an, in an initial investigative report. Uh, that report will contain all of their findings uh, from their investigation, and that will then be presented to the assistant director. Uh, our assistant director will review that investigative report to ensure that the invest investigation was accurate and complete. Uh, once the assistant director has determined that all of the ground has been covered, uh, and approves of that investigative report, it will then be forwarded to the executive director for another level of review. Uh, the executive director will then take that investigative report and have a close judicious review of that report to ensure that everything is appropriate and has been followed according to this, the rules and the standard operating procedures. Uh, if the executive director has determined that that is accurate and complete, she will begin drafting the proposed resolution report. Uh, and once that has finalized, uh, the proposed resolution report will be drafted in accordance with the rules and the standard operating procedures. Uh, it is important to remember as we're going forward through all of our uh, reviews that we do not operate under the beyond a reasonable doubt standard that is used in criminal court. We operate under a preponderance of the evidence standard which is essentially just a more likely than not standard. 
uh, included in the proposed resolution report, uh, the executive director will make findings of fact. These findings of fact are just determination of which facts based on that evidence that is contained in the investigative file is true. Uh, each finding of fact is going to be supported by a preponderance of the evidence and it will support whatever determination uh, of whether or not a violation has occurred. There will be four options available to the executive director when she reviews the complaints and the investigative file and drafts her proposed resolution report. Uh, each of these are defined within the rules. She has the option of sustaining the allegations, which means that the factual findings were supported by a preponderance of the evidence and that conduct was inconsistent with police policy. Uh, there's also the option of not sustaining the allegations, which is essentially that the factual findings do not support those allegations in the complaint by a preponderance of the evidence. Uh, there's a policy exoneration, which states that even though the factual findings supported the allegations within the complaint, the conduct of the officer or employee was consistent with MNPD policy and is therefore not a violation. And then the final option is that the allegations in the complaint were proven to be false in the investigation and uh, therefore they are unfounded. While the executive director is reviewing all of the file and drafting her report, if she determines at any time that the investigative report or the proposed resolution report is incomplete, she can return that back to an investigator for additional investigation. Uh, for example, if she is reviewing a complaint about discourtesy and that's all that was alleged in the complaint and she decides or determines that this discourtesy also extends past discourtesy and may include harassment, but harassment was not investigated, that can be referred back to the investigator to also look into that issue. Um, if the executive director makes a determination that an allegation is sustained, then a recommendation for corrective action will accompany that sustained finding to the board who will review. Uh, the recommendations for corrective action in a proposed resolution report will comply with the Metro Civil Service rules and the disciplinary grid that is set forth in the police department name. Uh, the proposed resolution reports will contain uh, the following, an executive director review summary, a summary of the complaint allegations, the police policy and procedures that were at issue in that complaint, uh, every finding of fact, a discussion, a discussion and analysis section, and then recommendations for any corrective action. Uh, it's important to note that in the board's rules, the proposed resolution report will be presented to the board and comes with a presumption of correctness. Uh, so essentially, the presumption of correctness states that if when the board reviews that proposed resolution report, uh, it is presumed that the investigator has done all of the steps necessary to prove that case and that the executive director's findings were correct. Uh, once the proposed resolution report is complete and is ready to go to the board, by the board's rules, it must be posted on the COB website at least 10 calendar days prior to being considered by the board. Uh, the complainant and the accused officer will both be notified uh, of that posting, and they will have up until five days before the board review to request to speak to the board in person at the review. Uh, Per the rules, permission is not going to be granted regularly, but may be granted by the board chair if good cause is shown. If permission is granted to one party to speak at the review, uh, an offer to speak will be extended to the other party as well. Uh, a minimum of two days prior to the board review, the board chair will have to let the complainant or the uh, accused officer employee let the, she'll have to let them know that either their request has been denied or approved. And if they are approved, they will only have 10 minutes for each side to speak. Uh, also important to keep in mind as, as we go through the complaint investigation and resolution process is the COB rules do put limitations on the conduct of board members in relation to a complaint investigation and proposed resolution report. Uh, two of those are listed out here uh, at section 2D3. Once a complaint is filed, board members are not to communicate with the complainant, the accused, or the representatives about any complaint or matter under investigation. 
if such communication does occur, it should be reported to the executive director. And under 2D4, this also kind of goes hand in hand with the presumption of correctness. Uh, the board members shall not conduct their own investigation nor add their own evidence to the record of the proposed resolution report. Uh, the reason that ties back in with the presumption of the correctness is the board is relying on the board staff to conduct these investigations and to bring these matters before the board uh, so that when we bring this to you, you know that not only has the investigation been done correctly, but it's also gone through multiple layers worth of review uh, by the investigator, uh, assistant director, and executive director before that comes to you. Uh, once the proposed resolution report is ready for presentation at a meeting, uh, the executive director will present that proposed resolution report. That presentation will include a brief summary of the facts, uh, determinations of whether the allegations are sustained, not sustained, exonerated by policy, or are unfounded, and any recommendations for corrective action. Non-confidential portions of the investigative file can be provided to the board. Uh, as we're working through the electronic meeting process, uh, most of the, fi the file will stay at the MNCO office to prevent it from being shared electronically. Um, that's just to protect the file. Uh, once we're back into an in-person setting, uh, the, the non-confidential portions will be provided to the board uh, in a paper format so that they can review if necessary. Uh, any confidential portions uh, will always be available for the board at the MNCO office. This is just to ensure our uh, confidentiality statute at 388.312. Um, and also included will be any copy of a written request to speak at the board meeting about a proposed resolution report. Uh, this will be to put the board members on notice to advise them of any concerns that may exist within the report. Uh, after the executive director's presentation, uh, the board members can ask questions that they may have about the proposed resolution report. Uh, it's important for that discussion to stay in line with Robert's rules of orders as required by the board's bylaws. Uh, once that discussion is complete, uh, in order to approve or take action on the proposed resolution report, a majority vote will be needed. Uh, it's the same as with any other motion. Uh, so someone will need to make a motion and they really have four options for a motion. Uh, that the proposed resolution report can be accepted as submitted, uh, accepted but modified, rejected, or returned for further investigation or analysis. Uh, and the definition of what those mean are contained within the board's rules. After the board renders its decision, uh, the board will have 10, or the, the adverse party will have up to 10 calendar days of the announced decision to file a petition for reconsideration. Under the board's rules, this petition for reconsideration must be made in writing and must also state the grounds for reconsideration within that petition. Uh, it's not enough to simply state that you feel that the decision was incorrect. You need to provide rationale for why you feel that the decision was correct or incorrect. Um, reconsideration will be granted if it is shown that there is newly discovered evidence that is material to the investigation that could not have been discovered with reasonable diligence and provided to the board during the investigation. Um, any determination on whether to grant a petition for reconsideration will be made by the board chair who has the option to consult the executive director. Um, if reconsideration is to be granted, uh, the matter will be taken up at the next regularly scheduled board meeting. If reconsideration is not granted, the proposed resolution report will become a final, uh, just a resolution report. Uh, regardless of the outcome of that resolution report, uh, all reports approved by the board are going to be sent to the police chief and the police office of professional accountability. And the police department is required to respond to that resolution report and the response will be posted to the COB website. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to try to answer those. Um, and this presentation will be available for the board if they would like to go back and review it at a later time. Thank you, Mr. Pinkley. When you say it will be available, will it um, be emailed out to us or be uh, we need to reach out to you directly? Uh, I can email it out to everyone. Okay, that would be great. That was gonna be my, my first question there. Any questions here, comments from members of the board here? Okay. Thank you, 
Mr. Pinkley. Uh, make sure I'm not missing anyone. I'm sorry, I'm scrolling uh, masterfully here. Uh, if not, thank you very much, Mr. Pinkley. Any uh, additional action on our part on this? Uh, no, uh, no, Chair. Uh, I think um, Director Fitchard had a a mock resolution report that she was going to walk the board through. Okay, great. Okay. I am going next, and um, Mr. Pinkley, if you could put up my resolution report. Uh, just one moment. Okay. Uh, is everyone able to see the proposed resolution report? We can see it, if but it would be great if there was a yeah. If you could yeah, the resolution uh, max would be great. Yeah, and that's a lot better. Okay. Can you fill the screen with it? Uh, so I'm having some issues where I, I don't have the authorization to present it with a full screen. Uh, I don't have that access. Uh, so I can really only share it in this this format. I, um, I'm able to blow it up on my end. I think each person should be able to use this side um, Zoom and zoom it in if you if you need to for your for your own benefit. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so this is a proposed resolution report that the committee and myself um, decided um, this is the format that we're going to be using. And I'm going to move quickly through it, but there's eight sections of this proposed resolution report, and those sections coincide with MNCL's SOPs for proposed resolution reports. So in this report, in section one, you will find in section one, you will find that is the ED review. It contains the information that was reviewed from the investigative file. And if you look on the report, I have listed the things that were reviewed. Um, that includes the notification of the complaint, the request for the interview, the signed Garrity form, investigative summary, CAD reports, incident reports, recorded interviews from the complainant and the officer, and it, it could include multiple things, but that for this particular mock case, that was what was looked at. In section two, um, that's the summary of the complaint allegations, and it contains the complainant and subject officer info, the allegation, location, date, time, as well as the alleged misconduct, which in this case is a discourtesy um, complaint. In section three, it is the MMPD's policy and procedures, complaints violations. It um, will reflect section 4.20.030. And this section is specific for the offense category. In this mock report, you will see that this is an offense category F. In section four, um, that's MMPD's policy and procedures, Personal behavior, section 4.20.040, section G is in George. Um, courtesy, and that in section G, courtesy is how they have it listed, um, as MMPD defines and categorizes it as a category F violation. Section five is the findings of fact section, which is the executive director's review of the reports, interviews, et cetera. And the section where the where I will lay out the preponderance of evidence and material facts of the case. Section six is the discussion, analysis, and conclusion, and is the section where the executive director will write up the conclusion statements after carefully weighing on the investigative material and the preponderance of evidence. This section will also have the determination of whether an allegation of misconduct is sustained, not sustained policy exoneration or unfounded. Section seven is the mediation section. That includes whether parties agreed to attend mediation for the complaint. 
And if they didn't, that would be noted. And then section eight, which is the last section, is the recommended corrective action. This section will include the executive director's recommendation for sanction. The ED will carefully review the subject officer's personnel, discipline, and OPA records and give an explanation of the sanction. And the police manual disciplinary corrective action grid will be included in this section for the violation category. And you can see that on the on the on the PowerPoint slide. Um, and um, it, it will have the include the different sanctions and corrective actions for the alleged misconduct. So if you look, it, you can see that part where it has the actual I, the actual grid with the offenses. And in this particular case, the sanction um, was a first offense. Officer received an oral reprimand. And the, the reasoning is the officer should have made every effort to meet the needs of the citizen requesting assistance. And so the proposed resolution report is brought before the board after the presentation to make a determination to render a determination on whether they accept as submitted, accept but modify, reject it based on information contained in the report, or return to the staff for further investigation and or further analysis according to the, our rules. And so that's all I have for that. Um, and before I take questions, I want to turn this over to Dr. Valier to address the board uh, regarding the process of posting this information on this document on metro.gov. Dr. Valier, if you can chime in. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I spoke with ITS about um, the process of getting these documents online since we will be accumulating these over time on the website. We wanna make sure that this information is accessible to the community and um, to everyone who would like to see it. Um, so we will be creating a table on a page specifically for proposed resolution reports that will give um, a little bit of information about it, about each complaint. So we'll be giving the case number, which will link to the proposed resolution report. We'll have the date posted, the date that the proposed resolution was posted, the board hearing date, the allegations, and af after the approval of the proposed resolution report, um, we'll add dispositions and we'll also be able to link to the chief, chief of police's response. Um, one conversation that Director Fitchard and I um, have, have had is about the information that's going to be included um, because there is the op option to have other information, including officer last name or, or um, demographics or complainant information. And we've had conversations about what is the appropriate information to be, to be um, putting publicly on our website um, in the proposed resolution report, as well as on the table. And that may be a conversation that should also happen with the proposed resolution report committee that um, was convened last meeting. Thank you, Dr. Valier. I agree that the, until we, um, I think that it's, in, in my opinion, it's it's best that we meet with the P, the proposed resolution um, report committee to discuss next steps on um, addressing how we will post this information um, because I think it's important that we do that correctly. Um, and the other thing is. We don't have a whole lot of time um, to to meet with that committee, especially with the the rules that state that we have to post this within ten days. And so, I would propose to the PRR committee that we would meet next week um, to address this need, um, so that we can move forward with having um, the web team create the, the 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 web the website area that we need to post this information. Of course, so that we would be in compliance with our rules, essentially. So um, I'm gonna put that out there and I'll take any questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Pitcher. Thank you, Dr. Valier as well. Any questions, comments here from the board? Thank you. 
thank you for the very detailed um, and incredibly helpful uh, tutorial here from beginning to end by the entire staff. Um, it's helpful. I know we've had these materials ahead of time. Um, I'm just checking here. No members of the board, any questions or comments here? Okay. Uh, Dr. Uh, Director Fitcher, any additional action or uh, uh, information here um, on our end on this matter? Um, I don't know how to go about, do we just send out a doodle poll and see if the committee can meet or, I mean, is that, is, we don't have to, or do we need to take a, a motion on that? Well, we can certainly take a motion. I, I was just going to suggest a doodle poll here so that the committee could just keep moving forward. I mean, actually, it's in the same spirit of the purpose there. Any uh, member of the board feel differently not uh, there to that, that approach? Just using a doodle poll to find a mutually feasible date and time for a meeting? Okay. I don't hear or see um, um, any one uh, offering a different approach here. So, Director Fitchett, if we could do that, that would be great. Um, Ms. Ross has her hand up now, Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Ross, please. Uh, the doodle approach would be fine with me. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Anyone else uh, here have thoughts or, or different opinion? Not? Okay. Director Fitchett, if you could, uh, remember your team yourself could leave that, that would be great. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank Director you. Fitcher, mm -hmm. uh, yep, absolutely. Uh, I was just going to say we can uh, go back up here to the MOU finalization discussion. Okay. Um, all right. So the MOU finalization. Um, so we heard from Chief Drake. I sent him the MOU, um, our final draft that was approved in July's meeting. Um, I sent it, you know, kind of late in the afternoon, and um, I would like the board to have, I'd like to have these, like, final discussions on what the next moves or next steps are so that we can move forward with meeting with the negotiation task force. Um, he also emailed me back and stated that he was giving it to his team to review, and so I think that we, of course, need to give them some time to do that. But I also didn't know what, because we kind of left it last month and we just need to move forward on it. And I just wanted to bring that back before the board um, in regards to the MMP, MMPD MOU. Um, as for the TBI MOU, um, I think when I listened back, um, it was just that we would move forward with reaching out to TBI and setting up a meeting with Director Rausch um, to discuss the proposed TBI and COB MOU agreement. And so I will take responsibility for doing that um, in the next coming weeks to take care of that. Hopefully I can get in next week. If not, it'll be the week after. And so that's all I have. But that's my conclusion for the MOU finalization. I will lead it up to the board to talk to me um, or to give me some guidance in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fitcher. Uh, uh, let me open up here to the board. Any uh, thoughts here or opinions uh, on the best approach or suggested approach here? Yes, uh, Mr. Sweeney. I think it was very positive today when Chief Drake said that he agrees with the premise um, of the proposed amendment, which is parity, um, which hopefully will then facilitate this process and get it done quickly. Um, I, I think the, the way the MOU reads at the moment is in order to go through the process, we need to convene the advisory group um, with, with um, um, Member Hildreth um, representing us. So I would suggest that um, we ask her to contact the others involved, I guess, through the mayor's office uh, in order to set up a meeting and to move this forward expeditiously. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Dr. Hildreth. Thank you. I'm happy to do that. Um, 
So I suppose that process would be, I will contact Mr. John Button in the mayor's office. And uh, when we can find a mutually convenient time, I will make this a top priority and Wednesdays are my only days of unavailability. So um, I will push to see if a meeting can be arranged within the next seven days. Unless there are other recommendations or concerns from the board. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Um, thank you for that. I was going to ask, would it make sense to um, um, request that the interim chief Drake be there instead of Deputy Chief Hagar? It's important uh, and valid point there. Uh, you know, D Director Fitcher, you've um, been a part of this meeting. I, Doc, Dr. Hildreth, I welcome your thoughts on that too. Um, yeah, I, I welcome thoughts on that. I will, I will make that recommendation when I make the phone call, probably after this meeting. Thank you. Yeah, I'm fine with and that it, I, as well. Yeah. Okay. Great. I thought I saw a hand raised there. Is there anyone I missed? Sorry if I did. Well, one thing I did want to mention, Chair, um, is that we still have this meeting, too, that's taking place on um, September 1st. And so um, we schedule it like we meet with this meeting. I think that um, Deputy Chief Drake also mentioned the meeting. And so maybe um, we can have the um, MOU um, meeting after that particular meeting of course if it takes so i just wanted to bring that out there the meeting with legal director cooper gotcha and that's scheduled for next uh, it sounds like next tuesday that's correct okay thank you mr sweeney i would suggest that we try to convert that september 1 meeting into the mou meeting because assuming that the mou gets executed there's no need for this indirect records process through the DA's office. Instead, we get the information directly the same way on DA. That makes sense to me. And so if, if we can see, not in that meeting is everyone is meeting, and if we can move it to whatever date fits Ms. Hildred's schedule, then yeah, I think that that would be a fantastic idea. I'm available on September 1st. Any additional comments, uh, questions here by any members of the board? Okay. Director Pitcher, any, uh, any additional action or comments we need from the board here or questions answered here? No, I think that we're fine. I, I had a, I had it as a board approval or vote needed, and I think that the board has made a decision. So, if you, I don't know if you want to take a motion on, or you don't need to. I, I, I really don't know. I think that we're good. Mm, I'm not sure that uh, we need to. Well, uh, Mr. Pinkley, I yield to you here if you feel we do. Um, and Dr. Hildreth, I see you unmuted here. I'm not sure if you were about to make a motion, but. I, I, my consideration here is we might might need to. Mr. Sweeney, I, I see you here, Race. I don't think there's a need for a motion. We've previously approved this draft by that with with authorization for Member Hilton to represent us. So now we're just dealing with mechanics. So I don't I don't see a need. For yep. That. yep, I agree. Yes. So with that, we can move forward. Uh, Mr. Pinkley, I'm sorry. Go right ahead. Thank no, uh, Mr. Sweeney covered exactly what I was going to say. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, thank you, so we'll move forward. Director Pitchett, if there's nothing else here on the MOU finalization discussion, but thank you very much uh, for your diligent and extraordinary work here as well. Um, we uh, have come uh, to our last bit here, and um, Mr. Pinkley, you have the floor here. It's uh, time for our COB Annual Executive Committee elections. Before we start, uh, I just received an email from Mr. Witzel saying he was having some tech issues and he was going to log out and then log back in. I just wanted to give him a chance to do that before we 
have the elections. I'm, I'm back now. Okay. Um, then just as a quick uh, overview before we get started, I'll, I'll be sure to walk us through this entire process. Um, the nominating committee met back in March, uh, and then I reconfirmed their nominations. Uh, the nomination committee, for those who may not remember, was Dr. Lewis, uh, Ms. Ross, and Mr. Hughes. Uh, they returned nominations uh, for the role of chair was uh, Mr. Martinez, uh, for the role of vice chair was Mr. Campbell Gooch, for the role of second vice chair was Ms. Ross, and for the role of secretary is Mr. Sweeney. Uh, so we're gonna take these each one by one, uh, starting with the, the chair role. Um, but before we do that, there is the option if, if the board would like to, they can adopt by motion the the nominees and hold a vote for that. And if the board is comfortable with that, they can have those people as their executive committee. Uh, if the board doesn't want to do that and they want to hold an election, we'll just we'll go through them by one. I just wanted to have that option on the table if if anyone was interested. Uh, excuse me, Todd. Can I say something for a minute? Yes, sir. Uh, before you do that, you got to clear the whole entire board. No one has any position. You clear it all. You're the strongest person uh, at this meeting. After you clear it, then you conduct the election. Okay. Uh, well, uh, uh, at, at this point, if, if there's no motion uh, on the table to accept the the current nominees, uh, then we'll we'll go through uh, the election. And I don't see any hands, so uh, we'll we'll start uh, with the role of chair. Um, so Mr. Martinez has already been nominated, so I will open up the floor for any uh, any member to nominate someone else for the role of chair. And uh, just as a, a matter of course, there is there is no prohibition on nominating yourself. So if you would like to be considered, uh, feel free to, to do that. Um, I would also want the board to keep in mind that the members who are rolling off in January are uh, Chair Davis, Ms. Ross, uh, Mr. Sweeney, and Dr. Lewis. Uh, so uh, Dr. Hildreth. Thank you. Is it too late to make a motion to uh, adopt the slate as recommended by the nominating committee? Uh, no, if that's if that's the route you would like to go, then by all means. I so move. Uh, is there a second? I second. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. Uh, any focused discussion? Then we will take a roll call vote. Um, I'll just I'll start at the top of my list and, and work my way down. Uh, Mr. Martinez. Hi. Uh, Ms. Davis. Hi. Ms. Ross. Hi. Uh, Mr. Goddard. Hi. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch? Nay. Uh, Mr. Sweeney? Aye. Uh, Dr. Hildreth? Aye. Mr. Witzel? Aye. Uh, Mr. Hughes. Aye. And Mr. Holloway. Aye. Uh, then our, our new executive committee will be Mr. Martinez for the role of chair, Mr. Campbell Gooch in the role of vice chair, uh, Ms. Ross in the role of second vice chair, and Mr. Sweeney uh, in the role of secretary. Uh, so at this point, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mr. Martinez for the remainder of the meeting. Thank you, Todd. Thank you all. And I, I just want to thank uh, Chair Davis for all of the work that she's done since we started. Um, I don't think we'd be where we are today without all the hard work that she's 
um, done. I hope to be half as good as she is in this position. Um, I look forward to meeting with the new executive committee um, soon. I think the meeting comes in two weeks. Is that right, Todd? The uh, that uh, the executive committee uh, usually meets a week or two before the next meeting, so that would be uh, sometime yet yeah, in the next two weeks. Okay. All right. Um, I think the next thing on the agenda is the public comment. Yes, the public comment. Um, Ms. Thompson is going to. We have two public comments, and Ms. Thompson is going to start those now. Hello, is everyone able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and play our first public comment. I have been uh, basically uh, doing battle with Metro National Police for the last two months. Uh, June 18th was the day that after I got challenged to run a story on how local police are seen all across the city now. We're seeing the mass rule, uh, but I went to the central and filmed the officers entering and exiting their own place of work without a mask on. I went into the central precinct myself to uh, request a officer complaint form uh, for the officer that I had confronted for not wearing told me that he did not have to wear one after the pair box that said he told me telling me that Chief Anderson had ordered all officers to wear masks. I was assigned an officer within the special investigation unit. His name is Conrad Straub. I spoke to his supervisor. His supervisor confirmed for me that on the door of the central precinct to find out which officers are violating Chief Anderson's orders to wear face masks, even though they had assigned Conrad Straub to me, and he had told me that the only way to hold officers not wearing masks accountable is for me to confront them and get their badge numbers myself. Uh, so I started doing that, and then when I had officers refusing to put on a mask, even after I confronted them, I went to the central precinct to receive a officer complaint form which the Metro National Back of uh, website tells me I can go to any police precinct and request a complaint form. If they refused to give me a complaint form. They sent down a Lieutenant Anderson. Lieutenant Anderson came down without a mask to speak to me. I told him I'd be to the city. And he also refused to give me an officer complaint form at the central precinct where at the time, there were no signs on the door saying you needed a mask to enter, even though the mayor's office, I had to get a temperature check and I had to have a mask to get into the mayor's office. When I went to the mayor's office to complain about officers not wearing masks, the only person they let me speak to was the Metro National Police Officer that's assigned to the office of mayor's security detail. I left that meeting dropping swear words at that officer because he obviously did not care about my concerns, just like the mayor does not care about my concerns, just like everyone on the Metro National Police Department could not, could not, could not care less to wear a mask until I absolutely made it happen for the entire city by contacting media and by sticking it to them every day for a month. Thank you. And our next message. My name is Melissa Cherry, calling from zip code 37207. And I, my first comment is to thank every member of the board and to thank Executive Director Fisher for her persistence in the face of immense obstruction in trying to accomplish the goals of the Community Advertising Board. And I wanted to take this moment while Drake is a 
in attendance. He requests that if he is interested in becoming the next. That he's willing and interested to work with the community oversight board and to empower them as an independent review board that has access both to witnesses, evidence, and records. I would request that if he's interested in taking on that role, that the first thing that he does immediately is to adopt the updated MOU between the community oversight board and the police department which has been written and completed by the Oversight Board. He can adopt that immediately to show his support. In addition, he can adopt their first policy review recommendations, which were published in June, regarding immigration and law enforcement. That report was delivered to the police department. who should already have access to it. As well as the MOU. Those are two things that are within his, his control and his power that he can do today to show that he is interested in supporting and empowering the oversight board that national residents of Illinois requested and approved. Thanks. And that concludes our public comment. Thank you, Brenzi. So the final thing is any new announcement. Ms. Ross? Yes, I don't know if, if I missed it, but I, uh, the community safety town hall meeting, did we discuss that? I don't believe we did, but um, I listened in on it. Um, thank you again to Chair Davis for helping put that together and the MNCO team. Um, Director Fitcher, did you want to give? Um... I just wanted to say one thing about it. Okay. Uh, I was very concerned that it was only 17 people that made comments. Um, I was not sure of the recruitment of participants. Uh, I just wanted to make a suggestion that maybe we reach out to more uh, organizations. Uh, council members i know some council members are having their virtual meetings um maybe some of the schools or whatever but i think we just need to do some more outreach in terms of getting more persons involved on those calls or if it was enough time i saw it once on um facebook that we were holding that but i just think it needs to be some more community outreach thank you Thank you, Ms. Ross. Um, Director Fitcher, when is the next um, forum that we're having? So thank you for that um, comment, Ms. Ross. I did speak with Ms. Thompson, and I also um, messaged um, um, Executive Director Mel Fowler-Green in response to some of the feedback that we received. And so we have beefed up our media outreach um, as well as um, I, I think the best thing to do is just let Ms. Thompson talk about it, um, what she's done to try to engage the community more in regards to this community forum. And I see um, our, um, I see um, member Davis's hand as well, but Ms. Thompson, if you could chime in a little bit, that would be great. Absolutely. Uh, I will say the, the last meeting did happen relatively quickly, and so we were able to put it on social media just a few times before the actual meeting. Uh, but in addition to it being on our Facebook and Twitter page, it was also on Nashville.gov. Um, we are partnering with Metro Human Relations, so it was shared via mail. Fowler, it was also shared on the Metro Human Relations social media page. Um, Metro Human Relations also shared it out with their community groups that they had we shared it out with the community groups that we had as well. And I believe it was shared with the board. So I, I do feel like um, we did as much as we could in the short amount of time that everything came together to get it out that first time. Um, it was also on News Channel 5 that morning. Uh, this time we plan to do the exact same, get out on social media. And we have a few days ahead of time to be able to jumpstart that. So that will begin to go out after today's meeting. 
Um, again, going out to those specific targeted groups for this upcoming meeting, because we do have those section or the next upcoming meetings are targeted towards specific groups. So definitely doing some one-on-one -on -one, reaching out to those community groups and asking them to share it with their constituents. And um, we talked about doing a couple of radio ads and then reaching out to our media contacts to do a press release. So we're doing everything that we can uh, on our end, being not able to get out in the community and really hand out flyers and post them in, in places. So uh, we do ask that as you get that information that you push it out to your constituent groups and shared and retweeted as well. But th those are the efforts that we have going on with the upcoming one and the next two after that. Thank you, Renzi. Uh, you bring up an important point that we can also do, we can also share on our own, via our own channels. And I think Renzi as well, um, and they might be included in the list of organizations that you're gonna reach out to, but the organizations that we consulted for the MOU, the initial MOU, I think should also get a direct invitation from us if that list still exists. Um, Ms. Davis? Yes, so a couple of things. We didn't talk about, I, I didn't touch on the community uh, town hall. Thanks, Ms. Ross, for the reminder. There aren't many um, updates to share there. There were uh, common threads around ensuring the chief of, uh, the chief of police um, was uh, focused on principally the engagement of the COB, that the COB had uh, a very clear line of communication. There were some other things uh, as well, and I noted what neighborhoods were there, and we'll see more trends coming out of that. Just wanna note though, because we're limiting the comments to two to three minutes, which is uh, two minutes rather, which is a respectful amount of time uh, for a conversation um, and lines up with our public comment with an hour uh, only slate, with there only being an hour slated for that conversation, we're always gonna have kind of a finite amount of, uh, of speakers for each form. You know, if we choose to expand it, that's another thing. We just want us to keep that in mind as, as we move on to the more targeted groups. The other piece of that too is to keep in mind that um, for the next one that's coming around next week, uh, Mr. Martinez, and so I just want to be real crystal clear, um, we had it slated as the chair, so myself hosting it, but my understanding would be that you would then assume that that chair role and co-host it with commissioner, um, with the commissioner of the uh, MHRC, is that correct? Yes, I can do that. I can take over okay. the hosting of it. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, thank you. And then also I want to be uh, clear also on uh, how the board feels as it relates to the um, to the police commission. Uh, so I was, you know, named identified at the time as, you know, I might carry the name of uh, the title of chair. So I would like to just be clear about whether the board uh, would like me to continue to serve in that capacity or if we would, you know, submit to the mayor that now that we've had this uh, new executive committee election, that it, in fact, it would be Mr. Martinez. I just feel it's important to go on record here with that too. Thank you. Does anyone have uh, any thoughts about Ms. Davis continuing as the COB representative uh, on the Police Chief Selection Commission? If I may, Chair, I'd like to, uh, to make a motion if I could that um, Representative Davis, I'm sorry, that, that, that um, Ms. Davis please continue to serve as a representative on that commission uh, for the Community Oversight Board. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Is there a second? I second. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Any focused discussion? Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch? Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, <laughs> does Member Davis accept that nomination? Ms. Davis? Thanks. I do, yes, thank you. Any other question, Mr. Campbell Gooch? No. Okay, um, we'll do a roll call vote here. Um, Ms. Davis? Aye. Ms. Ross? Aye. Mr. Goddard? Aye. Mr. Campbell Gooch? Aye. Mr. Sweeney. Aye. Dr. Hildreth. Aye. Mr. Witzel. 
Aye. Mr. Hughes. Aye. And Mr. Holloway. Aye. So that motion passes. Um, any other new business? Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch, I know you had your hand raised before we started that conversation. So if you were gonna, if you had something else, you can go ahead. Yeah, I guess the only other thing that I was gonna mention is um, possibly moving the executive meeting up. Cause I, I just realized how much work just changed hands that rapidly. So I was gonna suggest that we move the executive uh, meeting up uh, a couple of days or maybe even a week. I'm open to that. Um, Mr. Pinkley, can you try and schedule the meeting um, for next week? Uh, absolutely. I just one thing I would have the board keep in mind is that the uh, electronic meetings does technically expire on the 29th. So we may be having that in person unless that gets extended. But I will send out a doodle poll and try to gauge everyone's availability for next week. Thank you, Mr. Pinkley. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch. I wanted to mention that that is wild, that that is ending. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to put that here. Right. Um, and Mr. Pinkley, we don't, we wouldn't then have the option to meet online, right? We would be forced to meet in person. Unless it gets extended, um, which it may, uh, we would have to meet in person. Okay. And just um, let me interrupt one second. And if we have to meet in person, then we will need to figure out that location. And of course it has to be a Metro, um, location. And so I would suggest that we tomorrow look around to see if there is some availability and put it put the executive committee like in a holding pattern until we can find if there's availability at a metro location thank you director pictured yes a location where we can all be socially distanced um is there any new other new business or announcements Okay, I, uh, I, I have a thing. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. I just want to welcome the new executive committee and I look forward to working with you all. Thank you, Director Fitchard. Um, with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second, do I have a second? Second. A second. Uh, seconded by Mr. Sweeney. Okay, I will go down the list. Mr. Campbell Gooch. <laughs> Mr. Campbell Gooch. Aye. Um, Mr. Goddard. Aye. Dr. Hildreth. Aye. Mr. Holloway. Aye. Mr. Hughes. Aye. Ms. Ross. Aye. Mr. Sweeney. Aye. Mr. Witzel. Aye. Ms. Davis. Aye. And it's an aye for me as well. Um, thank you for the meeting today. I look forward to seeing the executive committee next week. Um, that's it. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.